how do we unlock the full potential of our minds? How do we unlock the potentials of our body? We want to explore today from bio-inspired innovations to re-energizing our brains, living in a more focused, energized state. Welcome to another episode of Khan Clinics, powered by the health section of American Muslim Today. I'm your host, Dr. Amir Khan. Generally, our brains often operate in a low energy state, running on autopilot, which impacts everything from our creativity mind to our daily decisions we have to make, whether being simple or complex. And in fact, it may even impact our health. So the question is, can we snap out of this state of autopilot mind, this autopilot and achieve more focus? Can we achieve more motivation and more connectivity to our daily lives? Today's guest will help us explore that journey. Dr. Jeff Karp is a Canadian biomedical engineer working as a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and the principal faculty at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. He is situated at Massachusetts Institute of Technology through the Harvard MIT Division of Health Science, where he is an affiliate faculty as well. He's known for his innovations in the medical technologies, mainly inspired by nature. He has developed materials and technologies that help change the field of medicine, particularly in drug delivery, tissue regeneration, and many more. But perhaps one of the most fascinating things is his personal discovery from overcoming ADHD as a child to becoming a pioneer in his field. His life has been a testament to neuroplasticity and personal growth. He's the author of the book LIT, Life Ignition Tools, a book that dives into auto-locking deep focus and awareness, helping readers understand how to rewire with brains to overcome daily obstacles and live in a heightened state of awareness. Dr. Karp, we are thrilled to have you with us today. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, so nice to be here. And thank you for inviting me on your show, Dr. Khan. Appreciate that. Let's start with your personal journey first. ADHD is really struck a strong chord with us all. The way you struggled, where you described your journey, where you had learning disability. ADHD in itself is advanced, is a state of hyperactivity. You mentioned how focusing was a challenge for you growing up. And tell us a little bit about your journey and what changes and adjustments did you have to make? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, this really started back in the second grade. I'd sit at the back of the classroom and just, you know, feeling demoralized. Nothing was working. I just wasn't able to follow along like everybody else. I kind of felt like an alien. And um, by the end of the year, my teacher uh, called a conference with my parents and said that he wanted to hold me back to repeat the second grade. And what my parents did is they negotiated for me to spend the summer with tutors and to catch up. And so all my classmates went on vacation and here I was in, in summer school catching up. And I had a transformative experience actually that summer in between the second and the third grade when a tutor asked me a question that just changed my life. Tell us about that question. What was that question and what impact did it have on you, sir? So I would go in every day and, you know, there would be certain games and they'd ask me questions and read me passages. But the, on this one particular day, the tutor asked me a question that I had never been asked before. And so she read me a passage, asked, an, you know, standard questions that she would normally ask me. But on this day, she paused and then looked me in the eye after I gave my answer. And she asked, how did you think about that? And nobody had ever asked me that question. And so it, it was almost like this canvas appeared in my mind, this ability to think about thinking. It never really occurred to me that I could think about my own thinking. I just sort of, I was very impulsive. I would just say what was ever on my mind. I would just act however I felt very impulsively. And, um, and so that moment was so transformative because it brought this heightened awareness to my life, this almost like this metacognition. 
and I started being able to do pattern recognition. I would be able to see like sort of experience thoughts in my mind and I would see that I had an opportunity to not say them or I had an opportunity to sort of engineer what I wanted to say. I started um, observing other people in the class and what they said in certain situations and so I started to develop, it was almost like I felt like I, if with a computer analogy, I had this hardware, but I didn't have software that worked for me. And I needed to program that software um, in order to survive. And that's how I started to navigate ADHD. Excellent. So going forward, you had this pattern recognition. You use that as a tool to overcome the learning disability that a lot of ADHD people have. And for my audience, ADHD is attention deficit and hyperactive disease. So your, your attention span is very little, and yet you're very hyperactive, seem normal, but yet you're not learning anything. But you realize that when, when in your time that, hey, I got to start doing this pattern recognition is going to help me overcome my learning disability. Would you sort of explain that a little bit to us? Absolutely. Yeah, it was like I realized that I was the coder of my own brain at that time. Mm -hmm. And so oh, to give you an example, um, I'd sit in class and the teacher would say something and my mind would start to think about it, but then I'd be focused on it and I would miss the next thing that she said or he said and I'd be completely lost. And so it, it's almost like I would get lost at the beginning of these classes and would never be able to catch up. But what I found is that whenever I asked a question, I would be able to hyper-focus on the answer for a few moments afterwards. And whatever was said in that window would imprint in my mind. I could connect it to other things I knew and I could recall it later. So I discovered that questioning was a survival skill for me to learn. And in college, I stopped going to some of my classes because I couldn't ask enough questions and I would just have so much anxiety because I, I would just miss so much of, of the lecture because my mind would just kind of be all over the place. Excellent. Thank you for that clarification. So what advice then would you from the get go give to listeners who have ADHD children or they themselves have that, would you add anything to say, well, you know, this is a strategy I deployed. You guys can also use this because I it worked for you, obviously. You're a pioneer in your field. What what sort of recs would you give them? Yeah, it's such a great question, especially for, for parents of, of children um, who, who have attention challenges it can be re really difficult for both the children and the parents. And I think to me, one thing that I've kind of discovered along the way is that ADHD or other types of neurodiversity can really be a superpower. And it also can be a process to discover superpowers. And I, I feel that you don't have to be neurodiverse to have superpowers. I feel like everybody has, you know, the, the things that they can tap into that are, are differentiated and, and, and really make, they can derive energy from and, and really, you know, they feel great when they, when they start to engage in that. And so for me, maybe I'll just give you kind of like an analogy. It was almost like when I think about how ADHD impacts my life, it's like kind of picture this, like I'm in a boat and I'm going down a river and the goal is to get to the end of the river, right? But what happens is, is that I'm literally bumping into every single rock along the way. And I'm not just bumping into it. When I bump into it, my focus switches from the end of the stream to the rock. And so now, so now I'm observing the rock. I'm kind of looking at it. And then, you know, then I'll get back and start going and I maybe hit like a br an overhanging branch and I'll see a path on the side of the river and I'll get out of the boat and I'll walk along the path and I'll start looking around and then I'll realize my goal was to get to the end of the river. And so I'll get back in the boat and go down. So to me, it's so when I get to the end of the river, it's taken far longer to get there. But along the way, I have focused my attention on things that have, are of interest to me. I've, I've now have like this whole journey, this whole experience that, so instead of being time focused, I'm more energy focused and I've actually been, you know, my curiosity is, is flowing. And so I think a lot of people who have 
ADHD and neurodiversity, they're curious about a lot of different things. It may not be specifically certain classes or, you know, so to me, one thing that we can do is we can help children, for example, or ourselves engage in lots of different experiences to find which ones we really gravitate the most where, where our curiosity just sort of lights us up. And when we find those, when we fi find those types of things, we can help children or other people to then engage in them in, in even more detail. Like I'll, I'll give you maybe just one other example, if that's okay. Please. Um, Please. I was speaking about ADHD uh, at, a, at a conference a few weeks ago and uh, a mother um, of a child who has ADHD came up to me and mm -hmm. she was telling me that her child was just really struggling in, in high school and she was concerned mm -hmm. about them, you know, kind of going to college. And so I started to ask questions about, you know, what are they interested in? Or do they say that, you know, are there things they talk about like frequently that might not be school related or might, you know, and she said, she kind of thought about it, thought about it. And she said, wait a moment. She said, actually, they're really interested in the stock market and they talk about it all the time. Now that's not necessarily something that you talk about in, in your classes. And so we kind of got into this conversation about, oh, well, maybe how, how amazing would it be if you could find somebody who has expertise in that space and they could become a mentor to that child? Because really, you just need one thing in your life where you can gain confidence in it. And then that can become, you know, a superpower. Excellent. That's quite an intriguing sort of suggestion. I'm sure they get a lot of confidence when they hear it from you and then you telling them, it's my personal experiences and that's my personal journey. This is how I overcome it. You can overcome it like that. So appreciate that feedback. Let's move on to your book a little bit. Um, LIT, Life Ignition Tools. It focuses on living with intention. Tell us about what made you write the book, first of all, and then we'll probably explore it a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in my laboratory at Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's Hospital, we work on developing a lot of different medical technologies and it is really challenging. And so one of the things we do to sort of intercept our thinking and to bring in fresh energy and think differently is we turn to nature for inspiration. Um, so this idea that, you know, hundreds of millions of years of research and development happening all around us and evolution being this incredible problem solver, probably the best, you know, the ultimate problem solver. And so this agent from New York reached out to me to ask, would you like to write a book about your work in bioinspiration? And I was really excited to write a book about it, but I sort of paused for a few days and I thought about it and I realized what I was had even more of a burning desire to do was to write a book about my early struggles and the tools that I was developing uh, along the way to survive and then eventually thrive. And so that's how that's how, actually how the book came to be. And it, it took me seven years actually to write write the book. Excellent. Yeah, there's a number of concepts from the book. One of them, the idea of pinching your brain to shift focuses. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? What does it mean? How, how can we apply that to our daily lives? Absolutely. I think, you know, now more than ever, we need strategies, tools, practices, rituals to help us um, use our intention to focus our attention because there's a trillion dollars spent every year on marketing and advertising to hijack our attention, you know, and it, it's just it's such a powerful force. And, and so it's, it's kind of become a problem because um, actually a major problem because our attention often is focused on what other people deem as important and not what we deem as important ourselves. And so we need a way to, to sort of regain control of our attention. And so what happened to me is when I was in the third grade, actually, I moved out to the country, like literally the country. Um, there was a sheep farm beside us, buffalo farm across the road, um, a creek. We had uh, a wolf. I'd wake up in the middle of the night, there'd be a pack of wolves on my front lawn um, going over to the sheep farm, you know, for a, for a snack. I, we literally have to call them to tell them like the wolves are on their way over. So, but what happened was, is I would walk along my driveway, which was a thousand feet long. And one day, you know, I would be really like ruminating, you know, I, I would, I would be in a negative space. I, I was trying to fit in with, the, you know, other people in my class. And so I wasn't in really a good headspace when I got home from school every day. And I would, one day I was walking along 
uh, this path, my, my driveway, and I saw something I never had seen before. And I got closer and closer. I couldn't figure out what it was. It was like kind of hanging from a tree. And I got up. And then next thing I knew, I was face to face with a bat. And what happened was is not only was I amazed and shocked at the same time, um, but I recognized because I was already sort of, I'd had this experience between the second and third grade and I was thinking about thinking and this awareness. And I noticed that all these negative thoughts were like squeezed out of my brain and all I could think about was the bat. And I started to think like, wait, maybe I could bring this to other areas of my life. I could actually intentionally pinch my brain to squeeze out thoughts and focus on something of interest. So for example, one thing that we can do, like just people can practice this, you know, today is you can take something like, I noticed there's like a pen in your hand, right? So what you can do is just as an example, you, you take things that are normally in your environment that you don't really look at. You pick up the pen, you write with it. But if you pick it up and you start looking at it, you start saying, okay, what are the different colors? What are the different textures? How does the light reflect off of it? You, when you start doing that, you've just shifted your focus entirely from whatever was on your mind to now what's right in front of you in your environment. And if you practice doing that, looking around and looking at textures and things, you're actually doing almost like a bicep curl for your attention. And you're able to then bring that to every area of your life. Excellent. So you're really pinching your brain to hyper-focus on something so that you can distract yourself from the surrounding other things that may be bothering you. There may be distractions, there may be some things that have overwhelmed you a little bit. Would that be sort of like the right analogy? Yeah, it's sort of this idea that our minds are often very distracted in today's society, just like you said, and we're being pulled in all these directions. And so our attention is kind of like a pen light in a way, and it's often shining all over the place. And I think we can really empower ourselves and really live, you know, really engage self-efficacy if we can find ways to hold on to that pen light and point it at what we want to point it at. And that's what this is all about. Let's talk about another area of interest that's been described in, in your work, and that's about autopiloting. I'm sure a lot of us have that similar experience. How do we break from that? And what's the advantage of snapping out of those autopilot modes? I think to really grasp and, and sort of be able to do that, to get out of autopilot, it's important to recognize why we gravitate to autopilot. And I think one of the major reasons is because if you go back 10,000 years ago and before, for thousands and thousands of years, we were hunter gatherers. We were nomads. We were traveling, you know, in groups of maybe a hundred people or so. And what would happen is, is that our brains would and bodies would naturally gravitate to this low energy state, this energy saver mode, because everything was about survival. We were outside working hard and we had to conserve our energy when we were not surviving. And because you never knew when the next threat would come, when you'd have to move, when you'd have to act fast. And so our brains we're like at a snapshot in evolution right now where we still have that primitive wiring and it doesn't serve us anymore, most of us, right? And so our brains naturally gravitate to this low energy state, this energy saver mode, this autopilot mode. And so when we recognize you know, the rationale behind it, it's in a way, it kind of empowers us to then figure out how can we intercept it. And that's what Lit is really all about, is it's a series of tools or on-ramps that we can engage to intercept that autopilot and redirect our thinking in more intentional ways. Living with purpose in life, living yeah. with um, a thought and sharing a moment or thinking about your processes. How do you balance that with everything that you're doing in your daily lives? Yeah, I think, first of all, balance. Balance to me is a really interesting word because, you know, we hear a lot that balance is so important. But one of the things that I always look for in trying to follow, you know, advice or to make steps forward is what's the process to engage to achieve balance, right? So it's it's easy to say, you know, like we should all be more balanced. And, you know, it kind of seems like, like a great thing, but it's like, how do we actually get to balance? And one of the ways that I like to think about this is the pendulum lifestyle, right? So the idea is, is that 
if we think of everything in life as a pendulum, right? It could be our energy levels, our, uh, you know, how sleepy we are, how, um, how much we're interested in, in engaging other people. Um, you know, sometimes we want to be social and sometimes we want to be alone. Sometimes we're, you know, we're moody and sometimes we're in like great, you know, we're happy and energetic. And, and so I look at everything as a pendulum. And so instead of just trying to strike balance, what I'll do is I'll try to say, okay, where am I on this pendulum swing? And if it's far out to one side, like if I'm, for example, if I'm really sleepy the last few days, I might say, okay, what's one step I can achieve that will bring me back to a little bit more sleep? So maybe what I'll do is I'll stop working at 10 p.m. You know, tonight, or I won't eat. You know, I'll stop eating at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. You know, because if you eat too late, your body needs to digest and it can impact your sleep. I might stop drinking coffee at 11 or 12. So, so there's there's steps that we can take to then achieve our intention. And so when we look at things on a pendulum, I feel like it gives us a process to then think about what's the step we need to take to bring things closer to balance. Makes sense. Thank you very much for clarifying that. So you talk about survival mode. Survival mode, that heightened state of stress can actually drive creativity and breakthroughs. So it's a little counterintuitive, but how does that stress state helps spark innovation? And how can we harness that energy? We're under pressure. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I like to think of things as not necessarily in absolutes. So sometimes stress and pressure can help and sometimes it can hurt, right? And so it's sort of like tuning into those moments of when it's beneficial, but sometimes it works against you as well. And so one of the things that I do is, you know, people talk a lot about procrastination where you're leaving things to the last minute. For me, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, procrastination is a way that I can get into the flow state. If I leave something to the last minute, I'm able to hyper-focus on it for a long period of time, like let's say for the, 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 the whole night, and get done what I need to get done. And so, you know, for someone like me who, you know, ADHD, my mind's jumping all over, procrastination is almost like this energy source that I can tap into to pressurize the system and help me focus. And so sometimes though it brings anxiety because I'll leave something to the last minute and that can cause, you know, mental health challenges um, in those moments and, and can really, you know, cause a lot of, of stress. But I sort of like to look at everything as energy transfer. So how can I tap into energy and sort of use it in ways that can be beneficial for me to get done what I need to? And procrastination is a way to sort of pressurize the system that I've, I've used as a tool to do that. Thank you for that clarification, Dr. Karp. You discussing our brains um, being wired to gravitate a lot of times towards these low energy states. Mm -hmm. And um, this often leads to creativity blocks or connection blocks. Tell us how can we wire up? How can we energize or re-energize our brains towards better connectivity, better connection to the world around us? Yeah, yeah. This is a major challenge, I think, for a lot of us. So easy to get into a rut or to um, kind of lose steam or become lethargic, hit plateaus. And we need ways to, as you were saying, infuse energy, get us excited, illuminate us, you know, just light us up. And the, the nice thing is that there's so many ways to do it. And they're, they're really simple. Because often what happens, and I'll just sort of share with you a, a perspective, which is if we go back to our youth, you know, when we were children, everything was new, right? Like we start riding a bike, we start walking, you know, crawling, walking, every grade is a whole new experience. Every skill is completely new. And so we're constantly just experiencing new every single day. But as we grow older, we start to gravitate towards an algorithmic lifestyle. We wake up at the same time. We have our coffee or tea at the same time. We have lunch at the same time. We go home at the same time. We do social media at the same time. You know, like it's like everything becomes almost this algorithmic lifestyle. And we tend not to do too many new things in our life. But our brains love novelty. Our brains love to do new things. And so when we sort of slow down doing new things, 
we actually lose confidence in our ability to do new things, which is where we can derive a lot of energy. And so one of the things we can do, just a really simple thing, um, and it's a little bit silly, but it, it works, which is you can switch the hand that you brush your teeth with. And what you'll notice is that it's very awkward at first. It takes longer. But if you do it for a few days, three, four, five days, you'll notice that you start to get better at it. And that is so empowering when you realize that something is changeable, that empowers you to then engage in more new activities and that can bring in fresh energy that has like a domino effect in your life. Brilliant, that, that's a brilliant explanation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carp, for doing that. My next question is about how you talk about um, focusing your brain with intention. And you think it's a game changer for or an important component for personal growth. For someone who's starting out, how would that exercise or habit be entrenched into someone? What suggestions would you give to the person who's starting out? Yeah, I think there's so many ways that we can use our intention to focus our attention. And I'll give you one example. So I think it's like, okay, let's say you're using your phone all the time and you want to stop using the phone, right? So you're like, okay, my intention is to not use my phone. The problem is, is that there's so many, there's so much great material on the phone. Like, you know, there's the, that is the magnetic, the gravity of the phone is so strong. That often is not a, a strong enough intention to battle that, you know, that pull. And so we need stronger intentions. And so I'll give you an example. One thing that, that I've done is I'll say, okay, I have two dogs and I take them multiple walks every day. And so if my intention is to connect with the dogs when I'm on a walk, right, then I can't be looking at my phone, right? Because I'm trying to connect with them. And what I notice, and I've experimented with this, is that they actually turn around and look at me. They make eye contact every once in a while. And when that happens, they it infuses energy. They start to gallop. They get, I can, they, they change, like, it's like I see the energy transfer in real time, right? And so to me, it's like I've used my intention to focus my attention on the dogs. And now I've actually changed something. And that, you know, I'm able to experience that, that, like, that something is changeable. And, and now I'm connecting in ways I hadn't connected before right? I'll give you one other example. Like when I'm eating, what I'll do is I set the intention of like, I want to, you know, we hear a lot of like practicing gratitude is so important, right? And being humble. And so, but it's like, well, what, what's the process to get there, right? So I start thinking about it. And so one of the things I start doing is when, before I eat a meal, I'll close my eyes and take like three deep breaths, inhale, exhale, you know, and I'm just sort of, I'm trying to create separation from what I was just doing to what I'm about to do. And then when I'm eating, I, I close my eyes for a few bites and I breathe out of my nose. And I notice when I breathe out, the flavors get enhanced. And I start thinking about where the food came from and the power of photosynthesis and the energy of the sun and the farmer's hands and all the energy that went into, you know, getting this food to where it is. And so that with intentionally focusing my attention on gratitude, on really thinking about where this came, the food came from. And I start to feel this deeper connection to nature. And, and I, I just feel it can unlock so much when, when you start intentionally focusing your attention on things. Brilliant. Thank you very much for explaining that. That's a lot of work is on. You've got to take a moment. You've got to pause. You've got to think. And then you're saying hyper thinking, hyper application of the subject and trying to go into depth into that and then start analyzing and then it gives you a different perspective about things and you could do it in your daily lives in your daily routines your daily stuff should you be doing it once a day twice what's your recommendations regarding that is it a practice you should do it every time or how do you go about doing that so to me to me i i think of it the way i like to think about it is that there's just in my mind and i think it's a personal thing but to, to me, there's no practice that I'll necessarily do for my whole life because there's something about doing practices for a certain amount of time. But then because our brains love novelty, I feel it's important to switch practices, right? And that's why it can be really fun and engaging to start talking to our friends and colleagues and family to ask them, what are their rituals? What are their practices? So we can kind of change things up. With the food one, 
it's so simple just to take a few breaths, you know, before you have a meal or as you're eating to close your eyes for a few bites and just have that experience. So that's something we can do a few, you know, two or three times a day, depending on how many meals you have or when you're walking outside. The other thing that I like to do, which has been transformative, is I cycle through my senses. So I'll say sight and I'll look at the bark of the trees and the texture and I'll pause, I'll look up at the clouds and the shape and then I'll say sound and I'll listen for the birds and the rustling of the wind in the leaves and I'll say touch and I'll feel my heels hit the ground and my clothes against the skin and the wind against my face. And by cycling through my senses, I'm actually I'm, I'm resensitizing the senses, you know, this, this culture, this society we live in, it like is, is desensitizing us right to, to everything. And so I, when I'm outside, I'm doing it every day. It, it's not like um, a laborious thing. I'm not, I don't have a strict regimen. Sometimes my mind's in other places, but usually once a day or twice, you know, I'm kind of, I'm tuning into my environment and, and it really makes a big difference. Thank you for explaining that. So it's not only hyper-focusing, but you're hyper-exaggerating your senses of looking at things, touch, feel, smell, and just absorbing the moment with them. Share us a few techniques for managing distractions that may be particularly useful for those with a busy lifestyle and a busy mind. So one of the things that, that I do is I'll write the word distraction on a piece of paper and I put a circle around it. And anytime I feel like being distracted or I catch myself in a distraction, I'll put a check mark in that circle. And what that does, it just intercepts my, my mind. So that gives me an opportunity to pause and say, do I want to engage in this distraction? Do I want to come, do I want to be continued to be distracted or do I want to come back to what I'm doing? And that actually helps me to come back. And then the other thing is, is that you can kind of look to see how many check marks you have at the end of the day. And that gives you an indication of how distracted you might have been. And so you could start to think, okay, did I have too much coffee today? Do I, was I too sleepy? You know, you can start to make lifestyle changes dependent on your distractibility. So it's giving you a measure. Another thing that I do is I'll put a, uh, like my phone and I'll put a timer and I'll say, okay, how long can I go without being distracted? And I feel the urge of a distraction. I look at the clock, it's like a three minutes and I'll say, can I go one more minute? Can I go two more minutes? And I make it into like a bit of a challenge. And so that really helps me to you know, reduce the number of distractions. And there's all kinds of things that we can do like that. And we, I'm sure we can find more substance in your book, the LIT, yeah. and there's a lot of stuff in it. So I'll encourage yeah. others to read that. Mindfulness and meditation practices, especially for ADHD individuals who struggle. Tell us, yeah. is it a big difference? How do they practice? Yeah, one of the things that, that I've been experimenting with is meditation. And you know, there's been a lot of things I've tried that haven't worked for me. And, but see, I think that's also the key is that sometimes you need to try, you know, different apps or talk to friends and family and, you know, other people to see what are their techniques. And I eventually stumbled on transcendental meditation where you're given a word and you basically say that word over and over in your, in your mind, you close your eyes. And anytime you have a thought, you can notice it and you just then try to come back to the mantra. And um, that's been incredibly helpful for me for a couple of reasons. Actually, what I do is kind of talking about ADHD is sometimes when I feel distracted, what I'll do is I'll close my eyes and I'll just say that word for like 10 seconds, like 15 seconds, just really short. And then I'll say, do I still feel the pull of the distraction? And most of the time I don't. So it's, it, again, it's like kind of cre intercepting this habit of distractibility, this, this pattern. Um, and so, and then the other thing actually that has been transformative for me is that, you know, I, I don't me actively meditate, although I did for two to three months straight, right? And that experience showed me that thoughts come into my mind and often there's an emotion with the thought and then that will then leave my mind as well if I don't hook onto it. And so that's helped me to recognize when I'm in a conversation with somebody, I notice there's a, like an energy of the conversation. So let's say if I'm speaking with my son, you know, he'll be speaking. And then if I say something, the energy shifts from him to me and he'll stop talking. 
and that's not my intention. And so through meditation, I've actually discovered the energy of a conversation and it's helped me to, you know, with my children in particular, you want them to find a voice, you want them to be confident in, you know, what they're saying and you want to, the, to support them. It's helped me to stop sort of interrupting them. And just because I'm now able to now notice when I interrupt them, what happens is they stop speaking and that's not my intention. One last question would be about mental energy. Please ask Dr. Karp, how do we maintain mental energy levels that help us cultivate some connections and and not feel overwhelmed at times, especially when we have a busy schedule. Yeah, I think I think it's so important for us to be in touch with sort of our cognitive capacity. You know, it's almost like our mental capacity is like a battery. And, you know, the more we use it, depending on what we're doing, it's starting to decrease, you know, over time. And we need to find ways to recharge that that battery. One of the ways that that I do it is through movement. And, you know, when we move our bodies, when we um, contract our muscles, you know, there's all sorts of biomolecules that go into the blood and get released in the brain that make us feel good. And that lasts for several hours after we've exercised. So exercising, I think is just, and again, if we think about it, you know, 10,000 years ago, whatever it was, we were all working like outside all day long, working hard. And, you know, we were probably feeling a little bit of pain, but we were also probably feeling good too, because of these positive neurotransmitters that were being released. So I think, you know, some of the things I spoke about before about doing new in your life. So recognizing when your life, you're not doing new things, you know, switching the hand that you brush your teeth with, changing the route that you go to work, changing the route that you're walking, like changing the scenery, because our, our brains get desensitized to things and we need to, to spark it. And so I think, you know, movement and doing new things can really, really help a lot. Any final comments for our viewers or audience? The only thing that kind of jumps to my mind is that I, I think um, the tools that I developed didn't come from my laboratory. They came from the lab of my own life. And I feel like everyone has a lab of their own life. And, and it's kind of really when you start to sort of think about life from that perspective, that we all have these unique ways of observing the world. We all have unique experiences, unique wiring. And when we start to notice that, it's just such a beautiful thing, you know, when we start to tap into, you know, we're part of the evolutionary process, all of us, we're all contributing to evolution. And so, you know, when we engage the world and in an authentic way and observe what's around us and have conversations about it, we can really, you know, tap into curiosity and we can really thrive. I, I really think, you know, we, and the last thing actually is just so, to me, is just so important is that we have this incredible biology that's working for us, right? Like, w you know, when we go to bed, we don't need to think about breathing. When we eat, we don't need to right. think about digestion. Like there's all this amazing biology that's working for us. And it's just such a beautiful thing and something that to me, when you start thinking about it, it's just, you, you can experience the awe of that, just like when you look up at the night sky. And I think when you start to do that, it, it just, it just, I think, illuminates your life. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. I want to thank Dr. Karp for his valuable insight. It's just been very, very inspiring and such an engaging conversation. I mean, uh, we're all very moved here. Thank you very, very much for giving us that valuable insight about your book, about your life and everything else that surrounds it. Thank you once again for Dr. Karp coming in on to our show and giving you that insight. I'm going to have to say, hey, please, all audience, don't forget to like and subscribe the show and bring in your friends and tell them also to like and subscribe to Khan Clinics and the health episodes that we are putting out there. Mm -hmm.